Okay, that's the end of the session. This is Archer and this is Lana, and this is the Roadmap to Success. We primarily worked with uh, Archer here in the video above. We went over um, uh, a counter conditioning exercise. And so uh, I'm not gonna talk about that, but, uh, except for a couple things real quick. Make sure like when you're doing that, now there's a place out kind of near the front of where the guardians live that would be a good place to do that as well, because the park that we're at is, is better. You're gonna see more action there, but this, the place that's in front is in the domicile. And so that sometimes are more guarding in their home than they would be out away from home. So, um, all right, so basically we started off by talking about exercise, but these dogs really probably have enough exercise. Remember, you can use an alternative, throwing the treats up and down the stairs, um, but I really, they're, they're not super high energy dogs, which is smart because a lot of people get buy dogs the way they date. Uh, we should get dogs, their energy, does it suit and match our lifestyle? And these dogs definitely do. Um, so we also went over rules and structure. And a lot of uh, people don't have any rules for their dog and they could, can, and that, that can confuse the dog in thinking that we're peers. Because dogs go through life probing, expecting and waiting for somebody to say that's where the line or the limit is. And if we don't uh, push back or we don't have any rules, we can't be consistent. Dogs go through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. And so uh, if we don't have good rules, we can't have good timing. We can't have good, uh, be consistent. It just really uh, makes it hard for them to understand. So basically, uh, some of the rules we talked about, uh, one of the guardians that can be difficult for not allowing them on the furniture. And I always go this, people always push back on this. Uh, the reason I do this is because the higher a dog sits, the more rank or status they have. Sitting the same height as us is one of the ways say, we say we're equals, but also the dog can kind of climb up on top of us. That's not disrespectful, but it is indicative of a dog that doesn't respect you as an authority figure. Um, and uh, let me see, other rules, Not uh, when we're eating food here, they shouldn't be in the kind of the L shape around the table. Uh, when we're preparing food in the kitchen, shouldn't be allowed in the kitchen when we're preparing food. Uh, they don't race up and down the stairs, but we could make them um, sit before we open the door and the guardians do a good job of that. But remember, only ask once, go to the door and say sit and practice this at times when you're not actually going for a walk. So you take that baggage away. And as soon as the dog sits and we open the door. Um, a little sidebar, we have uh, jingle bells hanging from the door uh, knob, and this is the most common mistake people make when they're trying to teach the dog to ring a bell to go outside. Dogs them through association, like I just mentioned. So if the only time I hear the jingle is when the door opens, that that's what the jingle means, door opens. So what you want to do is you want to put it, and I would put it actually on this side of the door, because when you put it right by the side that it opens, it creates a vacuum, sometimes that'll make it move. So what you do is you, I would clip one of those jingle bells off, or two of them, and take uh, uh, Archer out for a walk, or both of them out for a walk, and have them clamp so they don't make any sounds. And as soon as the dog starts to pee or poop, you gently ring it. Gently is the key word. The whole time that they're peeing and pooping. When you get done, you clamp it, then you pop a treat in the dog's mouth, and then you jingle it the same way while the dog is chewing the treat. It's about two or three seconds. Then after, uh, you do that for about a week, 10 days, every bowel movement. After a while, some dogs will just go and start ringing the bell, and the bell should be hung so that the, the bell that they're ringing is nose level. Uh, and what you can do is you can either take a toothpick with a tiny bit of peanut butter. Uh, I actually do it on both sides. I, so the toothpick is going this way. I have a tiny bit of peanut butter here and a big dollop here. I let the dog lick the dollop and the jingle bells are right here. And I put the, a little dot on the jingle. So the dog gets the dollop of peanut butter first and it can smell it and it goes forward. And when it licks it, that you open, as soon as it makes a sound, you open the door and let the dog out. And so that way, after a while, the dog will go ring the bell as his way of saying I want to go outside. And we have different rooms in the house, so if there's another room upstairs where there's a door and the dog might be behind that door, put a jingle bell in that room as well so I can jingle and that's your indicator to come down here. Now for the door exercise, what I usually do is I go to the door and I say sit once. If they don't sit, I walk within three seconds, I walk away for one minute and I sit down somewhere. Next time I go to the door, I say sit, and I, the second I don't sit within three seconds, I walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. Keep doubling length of time until eventually they sit as soon as you go there. Now, um, the dogs, uh, do they get really excited for the leash when you pull out the leash? Get excited? Sometimes, yeah. Excited is not necessarily happy when it comes to dogs. A lot of people confuse excited for happy, but a dog's going to be more prone to making mistakes when it's overexcited. So your dog gets excited, um, go over there to where the leash is, and as soon as the dog gets to you, make sure they're behind you, Tell them to sit. And when they sit, start reaching for the leash and that'll cause the dog to wiggle. Pull your arm back and say, sit again. So I want to stop with precision. Most people don't consider the stopping. That's half of how dogs learn. So if, if the wiggling, my butt, causes the human to stop reaching for the leash, it has to be repeated over and over again. And if your timing is good, after a while, it's always like, oh, I'm going to not wiggle. Oh, the leash gets picked up and attached. And anytime the dog starts getting excited, you, t you stop, 
tell the dog to sit, and if it sits in three seconds, you continue. If it doesn't, you put the leash back and go back to the couch and sit down, and the whole process starts over again. Um, all right, uh, I also went over uh, structured feeding for the dogs, and this is a video. I have a couple videos on my website that go over how to do this. If you want to find them, go to doggoneproblems.com. If you're on a laptop, on the, uh, click on dog training tips, and on the right side of the page, there's a search box. If you're on a phone, when you click dog training tips, the search box will be at the bottom of the list. But there's also one that's uh, email sign up. People get confused. So tr uh, type in structured feeding. What I do for feeding, the dogs are kind of rescues, and they're both rescued around the same time. They're a pair, and we don't know who is older than uh, younger. So what I do is I would put food in their bowls, in the kitchen, don't let them in the kitchen. This is a nice choke point. And then I'm gonna eat something first, whoever's feeding them in five or more bites of a real food. It can't be a smoothie or coffee, they don't understand it, but make sure you don't pretend. They can smell cancer in your body. They're gonna smell if you're faking a treat. And then when they're done, if one of them, let's say that Archer was protesting and Lana wasn't, well now we get done eating, I invite Lana to take her first, uh, to come and eat first. Uh, or if they're, all things are equal, I would switch back and forth. So one does one day, one does the next day, um, and, or next meal. And then when they take their first bite of food, use that passive training technique I went over. So when the dog takes his first bite of food, maybe we say taco for Archer, and then maybe we say sushi for Lana. And so when Archer takes his first bite of food for three months, he hears the word taco. Every time he takes his first bite of food only. When she hears taco, there's no food in her mouth. So it doesn't mean anything to her, but to him it means I get permission to eat. And then when he gets done eating, he has to leave the kitchen area, then she gets to come in. So we're not gonna let either dog be next to each other. This will increase feeding time by an extra minute or two, but it really helps every time you feed your dogs, they start reinforcing, they see you eating first and you're controlling the situation and you got my back. So it really helps in a multitude of reasons. Uh, let me see, uh, once uh, the furniture, you can get those X mats, that'll help keep them off the furniture. And again, 60 day, 66 days or more. And then after that, it should be a one-time exception. Whenever the guardian wants to invite the dog up, they invite. And I would come, you could, that'd be one of the situations you might come up with a different word for each dog. So you call mount on one of them and you call it, uh, you know, jump up for the other one, whatever it is. You can say red or blue, it doesn't have to mean anything. But try to come up with funny command words, especially for words, uh, commands that you're going to be out on the street. Um, if you come up with these funny command words, that can really help if, if you tell your dog to crash when people walk by and the dog flops down, people laugh. That brightens the mood and that helps him feel a little bit less uh, upset. Um, and just studies, more and more studies are showing that fun command words are really beneficial to helping dogs. Um, so um, passive training is basically waiting for the dog to organically do something on its own without any influence and just recognize them. So if Archer was standing and he laid down, I'd pet him and say down. If he came, and came to me, I'd pet him and say come. If he sits down, I'd pet him and say sit. If he grumbles, pet him and say grumble. Um, so name all your individual toys and come up with a unique word, like I said, for certain things for the dogs where I'm a unique word, a release word out of a stay, um, uh, a come command, so you can call them at the same time, you can do that, um, and then different words for eating. Uh, so that way, and there's a couple other situations where just you think about it, if you want to have one dog come at a time, that's a good time. I'm not saying they should have different vocabulary. It's helpful if they have the same vocabulary for most of the stuff. Um, but for passive training, we're just going to wait for the dogs to voluntarily or, uh, offer a behavior. Every time my dog takes a drink of water, I say cocktails. And so now I can say cocktails and the dog goes over and drinks. People think that's funny. So um, come up with these funny words. Um, and I would also uh, give them a command word for potty. I think you guys say potty, but I don't think you guys do it a lot of reinforcement. So when they're out on a walk and they start to pee or poop, say the word potty one time and then when we get done, pop a treat in their mouth and say potty a second time. I would not let him mark on walks. I would let him pee at the beginning of the walk and the end of the walk. And if he starts kind of going, and it's usually a vertical surface, you could usually see where other dogs have peed. That's where he's going to want to pee. He wants to mark over it. And marking is intentional and it is uh, related to a uh, position of authority. And he thinks that that's his territory. So we want to try to curb that and they will hold their urine so they can mark on a lot of different things. Um, I also have five rules for a structured walk on my website. There might be something else you might want to check out. Um, I use a martingale collar to stop dogs from pulling out of the, of the harness or the leash. Um, and there's a special twist of leash you can use that gives you more control of the dog. Um, but I just don't, I, we were just at the dog park. I don't like using prong collars or choke chains because it's a pain causing device. Um, okay, so up. So that could be passive training right there. He sat up on his own. I pet him and say the word up. So anything your dog does on a regular basis, you want to reward and they'll start offering you those behaviors. Um, let me see. Uh, if I want to get off the couch, I could actually just drop a treat on the couch, off on the floor and say off. So I put in context, jumping off is rewardable. 
I don't. I wouldn't necessarily do one for coming back because that's a reward unto itself. Um, another rule that you might want to have is have them just because the door opens doesn't mean they can run through the door. And I have a video on how to teach your dog to wait at the door and just type wait at door. I think you'll find a couple videos for that. Uh, these are different ways to create more structure. Now, at the same time we take away the furniture, I would definitely give them a dog bed. Uh, maybe while your surfboard wouldn't be a bad place, I'd probably try to move the speaker over if you can. Four dog beds. Four? We have four dog four beds. Four dog beds, awesome. Yeah. Um, and so I would give each dog bed its own unique designation. So you maybe call one Jamaica, maybe you call one Japan, one Hawaii, and one another island. And or whatever the motif is, it doesn't have to matter. But uh, coming up with something funny, if you say Jamaica, your girl runs over and sits on the dog bed, your friends laugh. And that motivates the dog to want to do that. Um, and so, uh, let me see, and if you need to teach your dog to go to the dog bed on command, go to my website and just dog bed, and there'll be videos that'll show you how to do that as well. Um, eating, we covered um, pet, petting with a purpose. Petting with a purpose, these dogs are petted so much they really don't have to ask for it. Most dogs will come up and nudge you or paw at you for attention. And if we pet them, we're telling them they're in charge of us. But even for people, dogs who don't, I usually recommend playing a little hard to get. If we get too much access to something, we don't really feel it, it to be precious. But if I can't have a hamburger when I'm on a diet, boy, I'm really looking forward to getting a hamburger. So playing a little hard to get and withholding some affection unless they do something to earn it is what petting with a purpose is. It's what it sounds like. So if the dog, I want to pet the dog, I'm going to tell the dog to sit. If it's already sitting, I'm asking it to come and sit over here or lay down. It has to do something to change its state in order to earn that affection from me. As soon as it does, I want to pet it under its chin, say the word sit, and only the word sit. Most of us use too many words for our dog. I don't want to say good sit, go there, bad this. I want to say just the command word because dogs typically hear the first word you say most prominently. So just sit, and also not don't say sit. Now you can now uh, Archer just looked at me, and you can use that in a special occasion. But I like to use very conversational English because that's what I'm going to do most of the time. Now if the dog does get away from you, that would be a good time to be say it in a really high pitched voice. And when the dog looks at you, run away from the dog. Most people will chase their dog right into traffic. So if you make the high, if I go to playgrounds, I see a little boy. He's like dang, 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 and he runs away, and then all the dogs chase him. So a high-pitched voice and then running away is almost a guaranteed way to get most dogs to uh, come to you. Um, all right, so petting with a purpose is if the guardians want to pet him, they're going to sell, tell the dog to sit or whatever, pet it under the chin and say sit. And after a while, the dogs will start coming and sitting in front of you to prepay for that attention. And that's a wonderful thing. And then you're, every time you pet them, you're boosting their self-esteem and their confidence because they're earning that pet. They're respecting you because they're asking you versus telling you, and you're practicing sitting, which is a more subordinate position, and it's a good, healthy thing for dogs to do. Um, let me see, what else did we cover? Uh, we went over a focus exercise. Remember when you're doing this, make sure you don't hold it at your nose, and make sure you always raise it up. First stage is we're going to get to 15 seconds everywhere in the house, one second, 15 seconds, and then say focus after it goes in the dog's mouth. Second stage is practice if you have a little deck or just out in your complex, but where there's no dogs or people around, so it's easy. And you go back to one second, one second, but it work up faster till you get up to one second, 15 seconds. Now it's important you get to the 15 second mark in the house within seven days maximum. You can usually do it faster than that. Uh, but after about seven days, they start getting bored. Uh, and then we do it outside and we, this time we go back to one, but we can move faster because the dogs know what to do. And we want to get up to the 15 second mark outside uh, when there's nobody around. The next stage is when you're walking, and I would probably recommend walking the dogs one at a time when you're practicing. I know not all the time, but some of the time. And when the dog, uh, and there's nobody around, every once in a while just tell the dog to uh, focus, it looks up at you, boom, boom. Now this is different. We're not waiting for the dog to look up, it is we're triggering the response, and then just going boom. And you might even have the treat here. Focus, the dog looks up at you, and boom, pop it in their mouth. And again, we'll back, go back to one second for that movement and work our way back to 15 seconds. That way, if the dog is indicating to us, I'm uncomfortable about something, and usually they'll do that by kind of pulling back on the leash or stopping or lowering their head, or uh, there are a number of things I'll talk about in a sec. If we recognize that that's what the dog is doing, and we tell the dog to focus, it looks up at us, and we walk down somebody's sidewalk and allow the other dog to pass, the dog says, they're listening to me. I don't have to defend them. I said, hey, there's a dog coming there, it looks like trouble, and they listen to me, and we walk down here. Now, the more that we enforce rules, eventually the dog doesn't think it's its job to do that, but right now that's just the habit the dog's getting, that his dog is into. Now, um, the things to look for, usually it's lowering the head and staring is usually the very first thing. Sometimes they'll hold their breath or breathe fast. Sometimes they will look away and not intentionally look at the dog. That's also a warning. They can lick their lips, they can yawn. Uh, the hair on the back, can, uh, well, probably not for her, but for him, we call those hackles, will stand up. The tail will go straight up and often just kind of quiver. Um, the ears usually come forward or go straight back. 
Um, and so uh, holding my breath and moving slow can also be a big warning. That can also mean I'm, in, I'm uncomfortable or I don't know what's going on. One of the things I have a lot of my clients do is have somebody walking behind the dog at about the five o'clock or the seven o'clock position shooting a little bit of an angle. So you get the dog and the handler and then the dogs that you're approaching. And so that way we get to see and watch later on a big screen and see, you know, Archer before he reacted, he lowered his head, he licked his lips, his ears went forward, his tail came up and then he lunged. So we know what those are. Then we kind of, we see another dog, we look down and he's licking his lips. Okay, we're getting close. Let's move him out of the way. Um, now, uh, one other thing that I do for walks is I start the walk off with a little structure. Um, I talked about making sure that it's calm before the walk, but once we actually go outside, I, the, I have 10 treats in my hand and I take no more than five steps for each one. Sometimes I take one step, sometimes five, sometimes two. And I, tell, I stop and I tell the dog, sit. When it sits, I pop a treat in his mouth and say, sit. And then I take up to five more steps again. So I do this 10 times before the start of every walk. So now the dog, when it comes out there, is, are you going to stop? He goes, oh. And you'll stop and the dog will just automatically sit. When it does that, you might give it a couple treats the first couple times. But that way the dog is now paying attention to you as opposed to paying attention to everything else. And you're setting your walk up for success. And don't be afraid to, before the counter conditioning exercises or before a walk, to exercise your dog by throwing the treat up or down the stairs a couple times, burn off a little of that excess energy. Um, let me see, what else? Um, anything else we wanna cover? You might want to list it, come up with a list of the fun command uh, of all the command words and say vocabulary if somebody is using a, a different version of the word come here versus come. Uh, you also, I, I say paycheck if I suspect someone's petting without a purpose. I say testify typically when the dog's doing something we should be rewarding. Uh, and I also say repeat or rerun if somebody's repeating the command. Remember, the more you say it, the less you mean it. Um, so, yeah, basically, uh, I, I don't. Uh, they're not bad dogs. I think that, uh, that uh, just Archer's issue is we just don't know what, what the reason why is. One last thing is if I have a dog that fails something or doesn't behave the way I want, what I try to do is recreate the situation. And I try to make it the easiest version possible in breaking down the individual steps. One of the things he's reacted to is people in black clothing, but also people taking their belt off seems to startle him. So he might have been abused formerly. Um, or maybe so, and it could have been just somebody pulled a belt out once and it just absolutely slapped him and it wasn't intentional. A lot of people think it's the worst case scenario, it's often not. But if you wanted to help your dog with that, you can use the same technique that I outlined in the video above. So basically what I would do is give, hey, Lana, give a treat and then slowly take off my belt. while she's, Or you could have somebody holding the treat while she's looking at it. So I'm preceding it and then the belt is coming off and then, well, I kind of like it when I get treats, so we can get everybody naked around here. Everybody comes around, take off your belt, because I'm gonna get a treat. So we wanna take that away, so make, instead of making a negative, it's a positive for the dog. Um, and then, oh, uh, for the dogs in your neighborhood, uh, that's, I'm glad I remembered. So keep a little notes uh, on your phone, and every time there's a dog that reacts, write down the date, time, what the dog looked like, what the dog's energy level was, and as well as anything else to know where they was going on. They were doing construction, they were jackhammering on the street. Well, that can create some tension and stress. So you might notice a trend when you start noticing, collecting the data. Every time it's a dog that's white or has, is taller than this amount or, or is really boisterous or whatever the case may be, those are dogs that we need to uh, practice on. So then you go to the dog park and you look for dogs that look and emulate like that dog and then you can have practice and desensitize. So next time you see that dog in your neighborhood, even though it was a different dog, it might be the same one in the dog park, but you wanna systematically deprogram that so your dog doesn't feel the threat. Now there's a, a bulldog that's nearby and there's another dog. Um, what I, a lot of times what I like to do is called parallel walking. So uh, when I have dogs, I don't know how they're gonna get along. What I do is I have them put them in shared experiences, but in the easiest version possible. So in this case, I might ask the people, if you see people who your dog is reactive to, um, next time you're out and walking, you're not, or you're out and about, and your dog's not with you, go try to talk to the person. Hey, man, I've always been mentioning, I've always wanted to compliment you on your dog. Your golden is just beautiful. I never say anything. My dog, I have a little you know, uh, uh, Jack Russell who's crazy, and he barks at sometimes at bigger dogs. Uh, but man, you know, and they're like, oh, thank you. Like, you know, actually, do you walk around here a lot at the same time? Because I hired this dog psychologist, and he told us a kind of a tip that we can use. We were trying to help our dog build up confidence around other dogs. He seems to be reactive to yours. I hate. I, I'd love to get it where he doesn't bark at you. If you walk on a regular basis, would you mind if we walk a, across the street, same time as you, and you do parallel walking? And after a while, he just gets used to being around this other dog, but he's enough distance where he's not reacting. That's the important thing. He can't react. 
And then the more practice he has being around the other dog without reacting, eventually you can get a little bit closer and closer. A lot of times I do it like a triangle. So as you're walking, you're gradually getting closer. And it might take se several walks, but eventually it gets to the point where you're walking together. Human, human, dog, dog, dogs on the outside. Make sure nobody's in front. Whoever's in front is perceived to be the leader. Um, but if your dog fails or doesn't behave form the way you want, ask yourself, make a list and how can I recreate that situation the easiest version possible and let my dog practice that over and over again to build up his confidence through experience, positive experiences till he no longer feels the need to react. All right, um, Archer, retreat. Archer, come. Archer, come here, buddy. Yes, it's so hard for you to get down. <laughs> All right, Archer, come here, buddy. Well, this is Archer, and this is Lana Del Rey, and this is well, actually from the TV show Archer, and this is the roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.